you need to talk to Greg. Those kinds of, of working relationships are very important. Cape Town Metro has appointed a stewardship officer in, that supports the Western Cape Stewardship Program. So, yes, those kinds of things are quite possible. <laughs> okay, I think we, we're running out of time. If you want to change venues, now's the time. A quick 10 second dash for the door so we don't disturb the next speaker. But while that's happening, I'd just like to challenge people that Ian's talk around looking at endemics and the challenges of trying to get the, the small five secured, make that link to the biodiversity stewardship approach. So I'm just challenging you to sort of make the links between all these presentations <coughs> that happen. Okay, so the dash was quite small. Um, the next presentation follows on quite nicely. It's Greg Martindale from Ezenvelo Kazan Wildlife, and he's going to be telling us about a specific biodiversity stewardship program in this province and looking at the contribution of biodiversity stewardship in achieving protected area biodiversity targets in KZN. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Um, tomorrow there's three sessions that are dedicated to the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund so I'm looking at my presentation as a little bit of setting the scene for that mm -hmm. and maybe starting to think about some of the questions that will come up in, in those sessions. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to briefly explain the rationale of how the Biodiversity Stewardship Program came about in KZN, how it's currently working and what some of the achievements of it have been. Um, I think, I think uh, a lot's already been covered in some of the earlier talks, and um, Ian's talk about hotspots already covered a lot of what I'm going to say in terms of the, the rationale of the program. But it's worthwhile noting from the outset that South Africa is a very biodiverse country. We're third only to Brazil and Indonesia, and because of that we've got really important things that are under threat that we need to, to protect. Um, Ian in his talk earlier did cover the fact that there are uh, three biodiversity hotspots within South Africa and it's important to note that that's unique. South Africa is the only country that has three biodiversity hotspots and within KZN our focus is obviously is on that Maputo, Ponderland, Albany hotspot which runs through most of KZN. Um, Willine stole my thunder a bit with this slide. Um, but basically one of the ma major drivers of, of uh, Developing a biodiversity stewardship program in KZN is that we've got very rapid rates of habitat loss through land transformation. And it's quite a stark picture if you look from 1994 to 2008 to see just how much habitat we've lost in that period. Um, so the other thing is that 53% of important biodiversity in KZN is outside of our existing state protected areas in private and communal ownership. And what that means is that our current state protected area system within KZN is inadequate in terms of achieving the, the protected area and biodiversity targets that we need to achieve. Fortunately, we've got a number of tools that uh, we can use to identify <coughs> where that important biodiversity is, and that's primarily our systematic conservation planning tool. But we have a number of others, including things like the, the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy and our Provincial Protected Area Expansion Plan. Uh, we've identified a series of macroecological corridors um, across KZN which are intended to link areas through the protected area system. And those are a big focus for where we want to set up biodiversity stewardship sites to try and create those linkages. And then we've got things, sorry, that's not very clear, but like, like the MFEPA uh, wetlands and rivers, the National Freshwater Ecosystem Priority Areas, that are areas that we want to try and focus our attention. So we use all of these GIS layers as well as several others to overlap things and try and focus our attention to try and capture the most important biodiversity in the province. In terms of the, the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy, we've got a five-year target which is meant to be achieved by the end of next year to try and get 211,000 hectares of additional land into the conservation estate. And the 20-year target, which is set for 2028, is an additional 842,000 hectares. Willine's already explained how this is a far more financially efficient way of doing it than through land acquisition. And just to illustrate that, uh, in the Western Cape, they did quite a coarse sort of assessment of how much it would have cost to purchase the land that they've secured. 
They've secured about 55,000 hectares, and the cost to buy that land at 2,100 rand a hectare, which is a very conservative price, would have been 1.15 billion rand. In contrast, they've spent about 2.8 million rand through the Biodiversity Stewardship Program in securing that land. So what biodiversity stewardship is, I think most people here um, have some understanding of it, but the, these five points really is, it explain what, what, what the program is about. It's a landscape-scale approach to biodiversity conservation that focuses on private and community-owned land. It's about securing representative samples of the province's biodiversity, and our targets are about looking at individual vegetation types and trying to achieve the targets for each of those vegetation types so that we're achieving that representativity. It's about creating a more connected network of protected areas in the landscape. Within KZN we have a number of very small fragmented nature reserves and other protected areas and we're trying to look at ways of linking those more effectively. It's about improving the management of natural systems and biodiversity outside of state managed protected areas um, and that's about working with landowners to try and achieve good outcomes for biodiversity and then very importantly it's about ensuring that essential ecosystem services continue to operate and deliver benefits to society. Um, for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the program, there are ba four basic categories um, or options for participating landowners. Importantly it has legislative backing and that's quite a big differentiation with historic programs that have existed, things like natural heritage sites, sites of conservation significance. Those programs, whilst they've been quite effective, have been very informal and have enabled landowners to come in or out of them as they wish. Um, the categories offer different levels of security and require different levels of commitment. So as you go up into a nature reserve, the landowner is making a bigger commitment towards what they are obligating themselves to do with the land and concurrently with that, we as the, the uh, Biodiversity Protection Authority are providing greater support to those sites. The different categories will attract different incentives and benefits, and Mark uh, Boerter touched on some of those this morning related to things like the, the tax exemptions and the municipal rates exemptions. All the options are voluntary, and very importantly, the landowner retains title and ownership of the land. Just to expand on those a little bit more, um, the conservation area is a, a kind of a catch-all category for what we would call informal stewardship options. None of them have any legal backing behind them. They are informal agreements that are made by landowners and they include things like conservancies, community conservation areas, natural heritage sites, sites of conservation significance. From our point of view they're very important because they're a good starting point for stewardship to happen. And usually if a landowner wants to make their site a site of conservation significance or community conservation area, they're showing a commitment to conservation, which is really important as the starting point for the biodiversity stewardship program. The next category is a biodiversity management agreement. Uh, we have had discussion already around the fact that you need, in order to do a biodiversity management agreement, you first need a biodiversity management plan in place. And there have been some of these done in South Africa, but there are a whole lot more that need to be done. There are currently ones being done for bearded vulture. Uh, I think there is an approved one for black rhino. <coughs> there are ones for turtles in, in KZN. But because there haven't been many of these done, what we've done instead is agree on a biodiversity agreement with landowners, which is a straight contract between the landowner and our board. The next two are both uh, fall under the definition of protected areas in terms of the Protected Areas Act. The one is a protected environment and the other is a nature reserve. They both require a declaration agreement which means that the MEC or the Minister must publish a notice in the Government Gazette which is how they become formally declared. Um, and they, they require things like a protected area management agreement that was touched on in, in some of the earlier talks this morning. Um, the main difference between the nature reserve and the protected environment is the nature reserve is endorsed on the title deed, which means that once the landowner sells the property, it remains a nature reserve. In terms of the, the value of the Biodiversity Stewardship Program to Ezenvelo, Kazin and Wildlife programs, it's one of the key mechanisms for protected area expansion. 
there are big efforts within KZN Wildlife to set up a land acquisition fund. But uh, if you consider that even if you had 100 million rand in a land acquisition fund, that's not going to go a long way towards securing 842,000 hectares of land. So we need to look at ways that we can conserve the land other than just through land acquisition. It's very important for securing key species, and this relates a little bit to some of the things that Ian was talking about a bit earlier, about some of those endemic species and species that uh, are of particular importance and threatened but maybe aren't charismatic, things like Hilton daisies or some of the other species that Ian mentioned earlier. It provides a mechanism to secure land expansion for, um, for expansion of species ranges. And the example there is the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project, which is a joint project between WWF and Isambela. It contributes to target achievement in terms of those um, systematic conservation planning targets. It provides a mechanism for offsets. Um, and there, there's been, a, I think there's a parallel session at the moment on offsets. But it's one of the ways that you can legally secure an offset. There are other ways, but stewardship is, clearly has value in securing an offset. It provides improved management for biodiversity outside of protected areas <coughs> through biodiversity agreements. A good example of this is um, a site out at Carcliffe, which is the, the Carcliffe Gartmore site. It's a working dairy farm, fairly heavily transformed, but it has wetlands in which all three crane species forage, and the grey crown cranes breed there. So it's important in terms of supporting the natural habitat in the surrounding area, and that's a good example of, of the value of a biodiversity agreement. It provides a mechanism to address climate change adaptation or resilience through contributing towards the achievement of those corridors, and then it provides a mechanism to make sure that the things that we're saying we're doing, we are actually doing, because we undertake reviews of management plans and audits of sites, so we can see if we're achieving what we want to do in terms of things like invasive alien species control. And then very importantly, it provides a proactive approach to district management. A lot of our district management within KZN is a sort of reactive policing management. It's around issuing of permits or making sure that landowners are complying with, with regulations and that sort of thing. Where biodiversity stewardship enables us to actually develop a, a constructive relationship with landowners so that we, we're working in a more constructive way rather than in that more negative, reactive way. I think one of the things that's made the, the program in KZN a successful program is that it's not an SM Velo KZN Wildlife Program. And I'd just like to direct your attention to our logo. It says there, Program Championed by SM Velo KZN Wildlife. And that's very much what it is. We work very closely with a, a number of a, other government departments, in, in particular the KZN Department of Agriculture, the Sandy Crew Program, as well as just about every major NGO in South Africa. And it's really that collaborative nature of the program that has made it the success that it is. Uh, more, more recently, the program has become uh, a lot stronger and has grown very much so in the last 12 months or so because of funding that has come through in the, in the Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund. The Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund is made up by those funding agencies which are, are mentioned there, um, and their focus is on biodiversity hotspots internationally. Um, and th they've recently focused a lot of their attention on that Maputo Ponderland Albany hotspot, which is shown again there. And as you can see, it covers most of KZN. So there's been a lot of funding that's come into KZN through the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. And most of the NGOs that are operating in South Africa have received some form of funding to undertake stewardship, and a number of NGOs have employed staff to act as stewardship facilitators, and they're now undertaking stewardship programs that's greatly expanded the capacity of the biodiversity stewardship program in KZN. In order to try and um, maintain consistency in the way that the program is run, we've developed memorandums of agreement with each of those NGOs and we're working very closely with them. So just to look at the, the achievements of the programs to date, we've currently proclaimed nine nature reserves, one, one, one protected environment, and three biodiversity agreements. We're in the final stages of proclaiming another 20,000 hectares of uh, nature reserves and protected environments, and we're currently negotiating 
approximately 44 nature reserves at 135,000 hectares. And it's that critical ecosystem partnership funding and the role of the NGOs that has really expanded the, the size of the program and is why we, we, we've expanded so much in the last year or so. Just to give you an idea of the areas that we're working in, we're working throughout the province and our focus really is in those red areas of our systematic conservation plan. The size of the areas that we're working in go from a 40 hectare site at Beacon Hill in Howick all the way through to a 45,000 hectare area in Upper Tugela. So we, we're working in a range of areas, different sizes, different forms of land ownership, from communal land ownership to multiple landowners, single commercial farmers, as well as big corporations like SAPI and Mondi. Just to highlight some of the achievements of the, the program, um, in terms of what we've contributed towards conservation targets, I'll just highlight some of the, the, the sites where we've made significant contributions. Um, Although some of those may not look that high, if you look at the number of actual hectares that have been added, they are significant. And although we've only added uh, 18 hectares of alluvial wetlands, the target for that wetland is 50 hectares and it's a critically endangered ecosystem. So that, that's a good example of where we've added substantially. Others like Zululand Lofelt, where we've made a really big contribution in terms of contributing 25% towards the conservation target for that vegetation type. Um, just in terms of contributions towards other targets, uh, the one that, that's quite notable there is that we've added 30,000 hectares uh, towards securing black rhino habitat and through the black rhino range expansion project, rhino have actually been put into those sites, those are sites like Somkanda and Zululand Rhino Reserve. We've added 4,000 hectares of Oribi habitat and nearly 8,000 hectares of wattle crane habitat, 2,000 hectares of blue swallow habitat. It's important to note that the habitat that we've added is considered really important habitat for those species. So it's a substantial contribution towards those species. Um, in terms of sites that we're currently working on and the future contribution that we're going to make, um, things like the Upper Tugela, which has been spoken about quite a lot, uh, and its role in, in providing ecosystem goods and services to the Tugela Val water transfer scheme. La Papangola, which Angus will talk about just now, but has over 2 million direct downstream water users, including 150,000 households that are drawing the water directly from the river. And Ganey Flay, which WWF are working on, with up to 50% of the water flows coming from the headwaters of the area and then a number of sites that are going to contribute towards some really important species conservation. I'll just quickly um, show you as the final thing some of these sites. Um, some of them are very exciting. I apologize for the picture of my son, but it shows the wetlands quite nicely in the background. <laughs> and um, there's the yellow-breasted pipit there for Ian. So this is a site that's actually contributing towards some of those endemic species that are important. Uh, the important thing about uh, the Mgani Flan, as I mentioned, this is a site that uh, WWF are work very closely involved in. It's the most important wattle crane breeding sites in South Africa. It has very high diversity levels, including a number of rare and threatened species. And it has immense ecosystem goods and services values for KZN, particularly for Peter Maritzburg and Etiquini. Uh, it's rather a strange name. It has a, a mountain on it called Mount Ararat. This is a site that WWF, again in the Nkongala Grasslands project, are working on. It's about a 10,000 hectare area. This site achieved the very highest score that uh, we've had in doing a site review. It came in for just about every kind of uh, ecological or biodiversity value that you could get. It makes up part of the headwaters of the Pongola River. Um, uh, Isabel Johnson, who helps us with a lot of the, the uh, site assessments, discovered a, a new species of probably Zeismanlobium, but it has to be described still. Um, has endangered vegetation types, very high diversity levels, and it has an altitudinal gradient of 838 meters, which enables things like climate change adaptation. So it's a very exciting site as well. Uh, Chinini Bagula, which we're working closely with Kevin on, um, okay, um, from Wildlands Conservation, 
is a site uh, just south of Tembi in, in northern Zululand. Uh, another very exciting site that will enable us to achieve the vegetation target for Maputo land, Sandy Bushveld. Um, it has sand forest that is in amongst the best condition in, in KZN. A number of very rare um, bird species and it's also the f brought a new primate species to South Africa which is this Grant's bush baby which was previously only known to occur in Mozambique and into Tanzania. The final site is the Upper Tagela, which uh, has been touched on quite a bit already. Um, very important uh, in terms of ecosystem goods and services and very importantly it will allow us to connect uh, Royal Mattel with, with Cathedral Peak. So that, that will create one continuous unbroken World Heritage Site across the Drakensberg. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a number of people that helped me with those photos. Thank you. He's really snuck in there, just. <laughs> so unless anybody's got a very burning question, we will take it. Clint, I'm sure you noticed the veg type contributions from your previous question. Any other questions? Great, that was very concise. Okay, quick dash between... Ingrid, you want to... Could you just open for the... Oh. Uh,